Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to this episode of Trade Winds. My name is Cecilia Malmström. I'm a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington. Today, we are going to talk about green trade. As the global temperature is rising and the emission of carbon is increasing, we are facing a planetary emergency. All parts of the society and the economy must contribute to the green transition. And trade has, since some time already, started to do its part. Sustainability chapters in free trade agreements, references to international conventions, facilitation of green technology trading, and the WTO are having lots of discussions on this. We also see different versions of carbon pricing all around the globe. But as the clock is ticking, we must do more. So how can trade become greener? How can trade contribute to helping the climate crisis? I have two fantastic guests with me here today, and we're going to discuss these matters. Professor Jennifer Hillman from Georgetown University and co-founder of the Center of Inclusive Trade and Development. Jennifer is also a fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations and a, foreign, a former WTO appellate lawyer. And we have Ignacio Garcia Bercero, who is a former director at the DG Trade in Brussels, just retired, but is now an advisor and uh, on the commission uh, to the Commission on WTO and Climate Matters. And you have decades of trade experiences as chief trade negotiator. So together, I think you have uh, so many years of trade experience and knowledge. So we will uh, we're really looking forward to hearing from you today. You are both very welcome. So starting, there's so much to talk about, but let's start a little bit with the bigger picture. In general, how can trade contribute to the green transition? Why don't you start, Jennifer? Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with you and with my good friend Ignacio and a real honor to appear on Trade Winds. But I will say particularly important is it's my really firm belief that we simply cannot get to the scale and speed that we need to get to to address the climate change crisis unless we use trade tools. So using those trade tools is absolutely essential. And when I say trade tools, I'm going to talk about maybe five that I think would at least set set the scene. I mean, the first one that's obviously the farthest down the road is the issue of border measures, such as the European Union's uh, Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, or CBAM. The idea being to put a tariff or some kind of a restraint at the border um, in order to both level the playing field for those that are going to have to compete against imports and more importantly, to discourage the moving of production to places where there aren't any controls on carbon. So in other words, to stop what is referred to as, as carbon leakage. The second big trade tool that, that is beginning to be used, but again, needs, needs more work, is disciplines on subsidies. And that kind of splits into two. One is, you know, what can we do to ban or phase out the subsidies that are supporting the production and the use of fossil fuels, which we know we have to move away from? And the other is uh, in order to create more space and more incentives for countries to grant subsidies, to support subsidies um, that will support the green transition. The third tool that I think is really critical is on standard setting. Uh, to help everyone understand, to use the same yardstick in terms of measuring how many greenhouse gases are embedded in the goods that we trade, because that knowledge will both help encourage dirtier companies to get cleaner and to ensure that we don't have a lot of needless disputes over fairness related to, you know, oh, you think it's this much and I think it's that much, and we end up with trade disputes over just the basic issue of how much, how, how to measure. Fourth tool that we clearly need to use is government procurement uh, to really harness the enormous buying power of governments uh, towards sort of buy green policies. I mean, if you look at it, the US federal government last year, just the federal government, not states or municipalities, you know, procured $763 billion of goods, the single largest buyer, if you will, in the world. And so the issue is how do we encourage all of that government procurement to buy green without creating unfair trade restrictions or unfairnesses in the trading system. And the last one, I think, is the issue of support for technology transfer. And I know that's an issue that we're going to get to later. But again, it is this issue of how do we use trade tools writ large to move the green technology out into the world, again, 
uh, with speed and with scale. So to me, there's a lot that the trading system can do uh, to support um, efforts on climate. Wow, thank you very much. Right into to the, the field of action. I think we will probably discuss each of these five uh, tools in, in a little while. But uh, Ignacio, would you like also to give the, the, the greater picture on how can trade contribute to a greener world? No, thanks a lot, Cecilia. And it's really a big honor to have this possibility to participate in Trade Wins just one week after I retire from the European Commission. And of course, I agree with everything that uh, Jennifer has said. Let me just take a slightly different perspective because I would say there are at least 40 objectives if you want to achieve decarbonization where trade is going to be playing a critical role. The first one is decarbonization of sectors which are carbon intensive and are highly exposed to international trade. The second one is how to expand trade and investment uh, on renewable energy in order to fulfill the target agreed in COP28, which is a very ambitious uh, target to triple the installations of renewable energy between now and 2030. The third one has already been mentioned by, by Jennifer, subsidies. And the fourth one is how to keep green supply chains open and resilient. So these are four critical issues if you want to move towards net zero. And in order to be able to achieve this, you are going to need trade cooperation. But at the same time, if you look a little bit deeper into them, you will also see that there is a really significant scope for trade conflicts. And I would just like to zoom in a little bit on two of those, just as examples. Now, let's take the question of decarbonization of carbon intensive sectors. And let's take a very important sector, the steel sector, which represents between 6 and 10% of emissions. Now, if you want to decarbonize steel, I think most people would agree that you need, on the one hand, uh, to increase the effective carbon price paid by the steel producers, that you need uh, to a certain extent uh, to provide subsidies to assist in the process of decarbonization, and that you need to expand the market for low carbon steel. Now, if these are the three tools that you can use in order to to decarbonize a sector which is very much exposed to international trade. What is the situation if you look into some of the key players in the steel market? Let's just look into United States, European Union, China. If you look into carbon pricing, the European Union at this point in time is applying a carbon price of around 50 euros per ton, significantly lower, by the way, than last year. China is applying a carbon price of 10 euros per ton, and the United States is not applying a carbon price. So huge difference in terms of the carbon prices which are being uh, paid by steel producers in these three jurisdictions. If you look into the issue of subsidies, the United States does not subsidize significantly the steel sector, but there are massive subsidies which are being provided to renewable energy, clean hydrogen, which of course is giving a competitive advantage downstream to steel producers. China is actually massively subsidizing the steel sector and has been doing so for the last almost 15 years, which has led to a situation of over capacities. And the European Union provides some subsidies to the steel sector, but much more limited than those which are being provided in the other two jurisdictions. So if you look into that reality, then you realize that yes, it is very difficult to see how you can actually intensify trade cooperation taking into account these very different uh, starting uh, points. It's a challenge. Let's look also a little bit further into the issue of subsidies that was mentioned by Jennifer. And I remember that Jennifer wrote a few years ago a very good piece about the appellate body, which he called the good, the bad, and the ugly. So you actually look into subsidies and you look at this from the point of view, impacts on trade, impacts on climate. You can easy, very easily identify the bad, I mean, many, Jennifer has already mentioned the production subsidies for fossil fuel, but also subsidies to carbon intensive sector, and if they are strictly linked to the carbonization commitments, trade distorting domestic support in the agricultural sector. Most people would agree that these are bad subsidies, that where well, you need to do something both from the point of view of trade and from the point of view 
of the environment, but then you get into the ugly and the ugly becomes much more messy because these are substances which may be good from the point of view of achieving certain climate objectives, but which can be very significantly distortive of international trade and investment. And there you have uh, uncapped production subsidies or consumption subsidies linked to local content requirements. Which from the economic point of view, they are very similar. From the legal point of view, they may be different than the WTO rules, but from the economic point of view are very similar. And then you have what people would say good subsidies, subsidies which clearly contribute towards the climate goals and have no or very limited impact on trade. There you would have, for instance, uh, consumption subsidies which are non-discriminatory in nature, investment subsidies which are clearly linked to the development of new technologies which help towards decarbonization. And I think, again, the source of tension that you are seeing is that the more that you see that your competitors are engaging in bad or ugly subsidies, the more difficult it becomes to maintain the discipline to stick to only good subsidies. And I think that is a debate that we are seeing, obviously, at this point in time, very much in the European Union. So I just wanted to mention this to show trade is absolutely critical if you want to achieve the decarbonization. Trade cooperation can make a real difference, and it's essential. But again, it's not going to be simple because there are going to be significant tensions underlying all of these, all of these issues. Thank you very much, Ignacio. And, and again, I think we'll come back to each of this. But if we start about the carbon pricing mechanism, you both mentioned this, and the European Union is sort of the, the, the first mover when it comes to pricing carbon via the CBA mechanism, the carbon border adjustment mechanism, uh, putting uh, putting a fee or, or, or a or a tax, if you want, on uh, on carbon intensive industries such as steel, aluminium, fertilizer, cement, and, and so on. Uh, and this is now being rolled out to be applied for gradually with, with the, a few years of, of entering into force. So how is this going to work? Uh, because we see that so many different countries have different versions of carbon pricing. I think there's around 30 different legis uh, legislations on um, or jurisdictions on different carbon pricing. How will these be combined in a way that we don't cause frictions, but that we sort of take the best out of it? Uh, if you start, Ignacio, explaining a little bit how the CBA mechanism will work. Uh, no, thanks a lot, Cecilia. Uh, I assume that uh, many of the audience would already be quite familiar with CBA, but I would just uh, explained the basic principles. The basic idea behind the uh, CBAN is that imported products should be subject in a non-discriminatory manner to the same carbon price, which is actually being imposed on the domestic uh, European uh, producers for a limited number of sectors which are uh, highly carbon intensive and exposed to international uh, trade. The CBAN is being introduced in a very progressive manner between now and 2026, no charges are being applied. It is just simply an exercise of collecting the data. And from 2026, it will be applied progressively in parallel with the phasing out of the free allowances. Because currently, domestic producers in the European Union receive a free allowance for part of the price that they have to pay. But in order to achieve the decarbonization objective, this needs to be eliminated over time. So that's the basic uh, principle the, on the basis of which the CBAN has been, uh, has been uh, developed. The European Union, by the way, has made very clear the, that we are open to dialogue uh, and to discuss with third countries the implementation of CBAN. And indeed, uh, we are engaging in different processes in which issues relating to carbon pricing are being discussed in the OECD, in the climate cloud that has been created in the G7. And we have indicated that we are open to see how the CBAN could be adjusted to take into account ongoing international discussions. And by the way, as we will come later on, we are also very much involved in those discussions in the context of the WTO. Now, I think there are clearly going to be a number of challenges. And I think those are challenges that the European Commission is going to need to face uh, over the next uh, two years before the CBAN uh, comes into full force. One needs to establish a methodology to measure carbon embedded emissions one needs to also define which are the default values that would apply in those cases in which a producer is not able to, to provide the data, which needs to be verified uh, to determine which are the carbon embedded emissions. And this is going to be a very, very critical uh, 
issue on which of course we are still consulting in order to to get uh, to get uh, to get it right there's also going to be the question about if there are ways of achieving the objective of Shivan while imposing a lesser administrative burden there have been questions about uh, the bureaucracy about having to fulfill all the data that you need to provide in order to make a Sivan declaration, particularly from the point of view of a small and medium enterprises. So that's something that I know that the, my colleagues in digital are very, very much looking into it. There's also going to be the question precisely that you have very much highlighted, Cecilia, which is how to be sure there's a good interface between carbon pricing systems, which are very different in design, which have very different levels of carbon prices, and I think how you engage in a dialogue with those different jurisdictions to see how you can ensure there is a good interface between the different carbon pricing regimes. Now, that's something which is only really starting to now. I think very recently a task force has been established in the European Commission precisely to begin the process of engaging in that dialogue. But I agree with you that's going to be one of the more challenging issues that would need to be tackled for the implementation of CBAN. And of course, some would argue, what about countries that do not have a carbon price, but that argue they have regulatory approaches, which according to their views are equivalent to a carbon price. And I think this is a conversation which is also going to be necessary, uh, going to be necessary to engage. And then it's also going to be the question about how you can help those countries which are vulnerable, which are, however, potentially impacted by CBAN because they are significantly dependent uh, in the European market, and how you can assist those countries in the process of decarbonization. The two most obvious examples would be Mozambique. It is the only low-income country which is significantly impacted by CBAN because 97% uh, of the aluminum exports go to the European Union. There's Egypt, which again, 6% of Egyptian exports to the European Union are on CBAN related products. I think on that, the challenge is going to be how you can ensure that the support that you provide to those countries more than compensates the impact that CBAN might actually have on their trade. I think there's quite a few issues that need to be developed as we are moving towards the actual implementation of CBAN. And I think it's going to require a very active diplomacy to engage with certain countries in many places, including, by the way, very much in the WTO. Thank you. How, how do you see this, Jennifer? You and I, we were at the WTO public forum in September, and this was very much discussed. And many countries from the developing world, they were sort of worried that this was a kind of green colonialism. They used that, that concept and a worry that there were too many different things up there. And there has been discussions of a sort of climate club or a climate consortium to try to conciliate the different versions. That is easier said than done, of course. Uh, what's your view on this, Jennifer? How, how can we move forward and what what would be the u.s contribution to this so again i'll i'll, I'll t basically take two two different paths here one is you know how difficult this i mean ignacio has sort of said it but again just to put it really out there in some numbers <clears throat> just to take one example which is steel so again a a, a, th a think tank here in the united states silverado accelerator looked at a single ton of steel and and looked at how you would assess how much greenhouse gases were embedded in that ton of steel. And they looked at it under the European Union's um, emissions trading system. So this is how, this is in essence what would happen under CBAM and found for this particular ton of steel that you would say that there was 0 0.89. So, you know, about nine tenths of a ton of greenhouse gases in that ton of steel. They looked at that same exact ton of steel under our California, the state of California, has an emissions trading system in place and how would that measure under the California system and came up with 3.12 tons of steel. So tons of carbon uh, GHGs. So again, almost a fourfold difference just because of the methodology. Uh, so again, you see that this issue of methodology. So then if you know California were to apply a CBAM to European steel, huge arguments that you're charging us four times too much because of these differences. So there's no question that this issue of trying to come up with something resembling a common standard on greenhouse gas emissions that are embedded, that are, you know, in goods that are traded is essential. And the problem is we've had standards for a very long time that have set the amount of greenhouse gases at a national level, you know, set by the UNFCCC um, and the IPPC. So everybody knows what they need to report on a national level. And countries have been doing that now for years. 
Similarly, um, there is this greenhouse gas protocol out there that helps corporations understand what they need to report in terms of their uh, greenhouse gas emissions that are over the entire corporation and over the life cycle of, of the products that these corporations make. The problem is neither of those methodologies help you understand how much is in this one ton of traded steel or traded whatever it is. So Ignacio was right. This is one of the challenges. And, and the hope, I think, for all of us in this space is that the European Commission and the European Union are leading the way because they're out there, you know, in the CBAM field. The second issue that is that is clearly coming up already in terms of US EU is that we're taking very fundamentally different approaches to addressing the climate crisis. I mean, if you think about it, you know, for for most of the last you know, 20 years, if you think about what has the United States done on climate change, it's almost entirely on the regulatory side. We have regulated um, greenhouse gas emissions, everything from the fuel economy of the cars and trucks on the road to, you know, how we regulate power plants and what emissions they can have to household appliances and more. So the United States, as a result, has had its greenhouse gas emissions fall by 20 percent since 2050. So we have been largely on this regulate, regulate, regulate path. Then, you know, along comes, I think, the Biden administration and the Congress recognizing that that's not going to get us there. We have to do more. So then the United States enacts, again, everything from this Investment and Jobs Act to the CHIPS Act to more recently the Inflation Reduction Act which in the end of the day is tripling the amount of U.S. spending on climate and clean energy, aiming for a 50 percent greenhouse gas reduction by 2030. So the U.S. has been on the subsidy regulatory path, while the European Union has been on some degree, some subsidies, some regulation, but heavily on a carbon pricing path. And so one of the other really tricky issues is, is there any way to say that some of this combination of regulation and, and subsidy support is the equivalent of uh, X amount of a carbon price or not. Uh, because it seems clear to me that as much as many of us would think that a carbon pricing system is the best way for the United States to go, I don't see it in the near term politically. And so therefore there needs to be this way to triangulate so that um, the recognition of the efforts that countries like the United States are doing through a combination of subsidies and regulation um, is still viewed as a valid contribution, you know, to this effort to fight the climate crisis. Yes, but it's getting rather urgent because the CBAM is already out there and is get you know, it's going to be implemented just in a couple of years, and then we so we have the the EU US. Uh, problem, so, so to say. Uh, but we also have other countries who do something similar, Canada, Japan, South Korea, UK has a CBAM mechanism as well, which is not exactly like the European Union. And then you have India and China who is taking the whole thing to the WTO. And so so the clock is ticking. Um, the question is, what we could, ideally would have some sort of international body who could coordinate uh, this, but, but WTO is not really there um, Unfortunately, so so how 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 do we solve this on a short term basis? Is the the uh, internal working group in the Commission is, is it going to solve it? Because th there is this uh, Trade and Tech Council that has been meeting for yeah. for some years now. Probably it was the last meeting, at least before the elections in in Leuven last week in in Brussels in Belgium. Uh, but this has been discussed a little bit, but only on the surface, right? Well, if I may, uh, Cecilia, and let me again be made clear. I'm no longer working for the European Commission, so I'm just going no, to be. No, you're here you on your personal own, capacity. My own, Absolutely, my own personal views on the whole question about the, the potential for a climate cap on a steel, because we started talking about uh, the steel sector as being one of the most, uh, one of the most uh, challenging ones, and it's clear that a conversation uh, between the United States and the European Union to, on the potential to develop a climate cap on a steel and aluminium is something which is going to continue after the elections, depending on what happens in the US election. But I think in principle, it's clear that that's a conversation that is very likely to continue. Now, I will just give you my own personal perspectives about the challenges uh, to make this work uh, in a discussion first between the United States and the European Union, and then more broadly, as you actually wanted to bring uh, more countries into the table, 
And let me start by paying tribute to one of uh, Jennifer's students, because uh, in preparing for this webinar, I read some of the articles in, included in this wonderful book that uh, Jennifer has edited. And I have to say that the one that was written by Kathy Simon on a steel camera club, I think is really an excellent uh, article. It's really something which I would recommend to anyone uh, to read it, to understand some of the challenges of developing a climate club in the steel sector. Now, is it possible to, to reach an agreement uh, on the, a climate club, uh, including not only the United States and the European Union, but also all main steel producers? My first suggestion would be is if you want to achieve that, it is important that the objective of the agreement is decarbonization. The more that you try to mix decarbonization with other objectives, legitimate as they might be, the more difficult that it is going to be to reach agreement on something that can actually work towards the climate objectives and which can attract more countries uh, to, join, uh, to join the club. So my first recommendation would be focus primarily on decarbonization of the objective to be, to be pursued which is not to say that it is not going to be important in this such agreement to deal with some level playing field issues, particularly the issue of subsidies. I mean, as I indicated before, the subsidies said to the steel sector, depending on how they are designed, they are bad for climate, they are bad from the level playing field uh, perspective. So I think any type of uh, climate club that could be developed in the steel sector, in my view, would need to include a strict disciplines on the subsidies. I don't see how it could actually work, uh, work otherwise. Certainly, I heard what Jennifer said about the difficulties about uh, developing the, a carbon price in the United States. I still think it's going to be very, very difficult to justify that you apply an external charge on imports. If you are not applying any charge or any strict regulatory requirement, on those steel producers in the United States, which are carbon intensive. Now, if you look into the average, it is true. The United States has a very good average carbon intensity for the steel sector because of the main producers using a modern technology, but it also has producers which are uh, very carbon intensive. And I think it would be very difficult to justify that you apply some restrictions on imports if you apply nothing domestically on your dirty steel producers. Now, I know that there is legislation in Congress, we would do that, the, the Clean Competition Act, which I know Jennifer has been, has been following closely, but I think it's going to be very, very difficult to see how you could actually make a workable to climate cap on steel if there is no binding constraint on domestic producers that are actually carbon intensive. And then I think you would need to accept that it's going to be very difficult to imagine that you have a uniform external tariff. Because at the end of the day, there's always going to have to be some correspondence between what you do vis-a-vis -vis those countries which are not part of the club and what you are and the constraints that you are imposing on your producers. And because these are not going to be harmonized, I find it difficult to imagine that the constraints on domestic producers are going to be harmonized. Some degree of variety in terms of the measures that you are applied to the countries which are outside of the club, I think is going to be probably unavoidable. Uh, so I would just make those comments. Obviously, a lot of this depends on politics, uh, uh, what happens in the United States after the elections. But I think that the conversation about the issue about uh, trying to establish uh, a climate club on the steel sector is something which is worth continuing. But it's challenging. Can, I'll, I'll just Jen, jump. Yes, can I just please. jump in on a couple things? Absolutely. One, I, I will. I will completely agree that uh, with Ignacio that I do not believe that it is consistent with um, the United States' W two obligations or anyone's to impose a border measure unless there is a domestic charge. And for what it's worth, the Clean Competition Act does have a domestic charge, and we could fight over whether or not you know it's exactly consistent. But my own view is I agree that um, if countries are going to impose a border measure. They need to have some kind of a of a domestic charge um, in order for there to be just basic, you know, to meet basic rules of non-discrimination. The second thing I will say is I think Ignacio was exactly right. If we're going to get there, I think it's going to have to be done sectorally, uh, where we pick you know, some of the key sectors where there is the most amount of greenhouse gases embedded in these traded goods and go down the road of trying to set these standards at a sectoral level. Partly because the measurements, again, within each sector are really different. The technologies for decarbonizing tend to be very sectoral. Uh, and the trade tends to be, you know, kind of different depending on what the sectors are. I mean, you go to a sector like aluminum, 
And there really are much smaller number of players, much smaller number of countries that you would have to have involved, um, and much different technologies. So there I do see a lot of hope that you could think about certain sectoral clubs. Uh, because the other piece of it, and I think Ignacio has touched on this to some degree, is you have to include the major emitters. And in many of these sectors, that means China. Um, and so you're going to have to find a way to bring China within um, that same framework. And therefore, that means you're going to have to do this um, in a way that is that is not you know, on its face discriminatory and at the same time addresses the level of subsidies in China that are otherwise perceived as creating an unfairness that won't allow you to have a system with all with the U.S., the EU, China and others in the same system. Yes, obviously, China is a big emitter and needs to be involved as well. Uh, coming back a little bit to, to subsidies, Jennifer, you've written a lot about subsidies and you mentioned it at one as one of the most important tools to, to have there as well. And there is WTO legislation and WTO uh, rules on good subsidies and bad subsidies, but it's a little bit outdated. But what we see now is a massive increase of, of subsidies, of course, all around the world. Some are good, some are bad, and obviously some are good for one country, but hurting the other. H how can we come to some sort of agreement here? Shall we start with the EU-US, or do, does it have to move back to the WTO again? Is that realistic, or is there another four hour we can discuss this? Because obviously it's a global problem. Yeah, my, my own view is at some level, there has to be some agreements among the big subsidizers, if you will, uh, that could then be taken back to a forum like the WTO. Um, and, and the problem is, I, I actually don't think the rules are very clear or really are, are, are there to sort of divide out what we would consider to be a good and a bad subsidy. So I think one of the first places to start is to think about what are the mechanisms that we could do that. Um, and obviously, there is right now at the WTO a fairly significant effort to try to address fossil fuel subsidies. And again, even within that limited category of fossil fuel subsidies, you know, it's difficult. If you look at those subsidies, 85% of the subsidies in the fossil fuel area are to support consumers. You know, and here in the United States, for example, an awful lot of that is, for example, to support um, heating oil for people that live in the northern parts of the United States that are very cold in the winter. So, it, you know, when you think about it, it's one thing to say you shouldn't be subsidizing, you know, the pumping up of oil and gas. You shouldn't be subsidizing the production of more fossil fuels. It's another thing to tell, you know, an elderly single woman living in Maine, too bad, uh, you're not going to get any support for your heating. And so there has to be some way to think about even fossil fuel subsidies, understanding the sort of what was the subsidy granted for, and that certain kinds of subsidies may take a different kind of a phase out road uh, than others. When you flip over to, to the green side, if you will, the, the, what I'll call the good subsidies, again, there is no really agreed upon definition of exactly what is, what constitutes a green subsidy. Uh, so my own writing and my own thinking has been, let's at least start by having countries start to notify to the WTO, they're already required to notify subsidies, but could we add an extra box in the notification that just says, I think this is a green subsidy. I'm going to tell you all about it. I'm going to tell you why I think it's a green subsidy on the theory that that transparency might lead in, in a couple of different places. One, it may ultimately lead to the idea of creating a safe harbor, um, that if it is a genuine green subsidy and if you've notified it and told everybody in the world about it, that maybe we get to the place where we say, I won't challenge it. No one will challenge it as either countervailable or subject to other disciplines because it is notified as a green subsidy. And the second idea behind that is to create a lot of transparency about what is everybody doing in this green subsidy space so that maybe we can start sharing best practices. Oh, don't go down that road. That one didn't really work. Oh, this one, you know, is is seeming to produce some real results and some ability to think about then sharing the technology or or the the results of a really useful green subsidy uh, kind of with with others that need need to get their hands on that technology. So I, I actually do think the WTO may be the place, if for no other reason than for the increased transparency around what countries believe that they are doing, self-declaration, you know, I think this is a green subsidy and I'm telling you all about it on the hope that we could then come to some common definitions of what should be in that green box.
this realistic, Ignacio? Uh, well, I, I, let me put it this way. I think it's a challenge, but I think it must be faced. Now, let me say that uh, from our point of view, we are a little bit frustrated that it was not possible to reach an agreement uh, in NC13 to launch deliberations in the WTO on what we call the trade and industrial policy interface, because it is a, one of the most important issues which is facing the global trading system. It's important for climate, but it has also a broader implication to, than climate. It was not possible to reach agreement because in the WTO, you always need to, to work on the basis of consensus. Now, this being said, I think there's a huge amount of interest in Geneva to continue these conversations. And I would agree with Jennifer that probably one of the first issues on which to start is the whole question of transparency. What can mm -hmm. be done to have more information, more understanding about the different subsidy practices which are being followed by, by countries? And then I think it will also be useful to have a discussion not a negotiating discussion, but a discussion to understand what are the type of subsidies that countries are being applied in order to achieve uh, climate objectives and how they think that these subsidies can be designed in a manner which has minimal or no negative uh, spillover effects for others. I think it's a conversation which I think needs to, needs to take place. This is something which is ripe for a negotiation that's a different matter. I think we can talk a little bit more about what eventually could be done in the WTO. But I think in any case, this is something that's important, of course, to discuss between the United States and the European Union. And by the way, in the negotiations of the steel and aluminum agreement, there were some useful conversations on subsidies. I mean, I, I know from my colleagues who were involved, there was quite a significant progress, at least on the bad subsidies, not necessarily yet on the good ones, but at least on the bad subsidies, there was a significant amount of progress in our bilateral discussion. We also still have this trilateral group, uh, including Japan, and I know Japan will be interested in continuing this kind of conversation. There are discussions about subsidies in the OECD, so there's quite a few places where you can actually talk about the issue, but eventually if you really want to do something about it, inevitably you are going to have to involve the big subsidizers and we all know the big subsidizer is China. So at the mm. end of the day, for this to actually make a difference, you need to find a way to engage China in this conversation. And by the way, China mm -hmm. was not the country that objected to dealing with this issue in the WTO. I think also the WTO, the IMF, OECD, and the World Bank yes. are, have launched yeah. a joint database in order to try to gather as much as information and give transparency to different, uh, different subsidies. Um, J Jennifer, there's also a question in, in the chat about what you said about government procurement. Uh, the EU has um, has uh, a, dis a regulation that, that you can take into uh, account sustainability criteria in, in the public procurement, but you don't have to. It's a voluntary basis. How does it work in, in the US? And is this something that, that could be spread uh, and shared with other countries? So uh, I would and say the U.S. Uh, 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 right, at this moment, the U.S. still does not have this kind of binding requirements. There are some binding requirements with respect to not go, no government purchases that involve labor violations, forced labor, child labor, et cetera. And I think the issue then is, could that same notion uh, be applied on, on the green side that all whatever it is, all rebar going into government construction, you know, that's a steel product, has to be X amount of green. Uh, we're not there yet, uh, but again, I think the, the perception is that this is a real tool that you could start building in sort of minimums of you cannot use X, Y, or Z products. You cannot purchase with federal government money products that are not at least at some level. I mean, obviously, everybody has to meet a basic regulatory requirement. You can't you can't purchase goods that are that are in essence illegal because they're not consistent with basic regulations for safety and quality. But whether you could up those in terms of where they are on green is one of those issues that a lot of people are starting to focus on whether that's another area in which we in the United States could use, um, in essence, the purchasing power of the federal government to set a new kind of norm or standard for how green goods have to be um, in order to be, you know, to be eligible to be purchased under under a procurement contract. 
So no, we're not, not sure. there yet, but, but, you know, aspirationally, my own view is that's one of the places in which, you know, there really could be a difference made that would, that would significantly aid. Ignacio, uh, in Europe, how can this be stepped up and what's the evaluation so far of sustainability criteria in the public procurement? I know that it works in some municipalities and, and cities or in different countries of the European Union. They're very strict on this, but it, it varies a lot between the different Yeah, because parts I think Europe. that the, I'm, well, I'm not a real expert on this, Cecilia, to be, to be honest. Uh, it is true that under our legislation that the authorities which are involved in procurement uh, uh, in procurement activities have a significant margin of discretion when it comes mm -hmm. to the application of these uh, sustainability requirements. So I suspect that it is the case that uh, in some uh, authorities this is being applied more strictly than others. But to to be fair, I mean I'm not really very familiar on this. You know, this is for us mainly a single market issue. It is our friends in DigiGrow who are supposed to be monitoring the, the implementation of the procurement directives. Absolutely. Uh, let, let's turn to, to the WTO because you both mentioned it in several occasions and you both have ample experience of WTO. And of course, WTO ideally would be the place. I mean, the, the climate change is such a huge global challenge. And with 166 member countries, it would be the place, maybe not to solve, but at least to have a conversation. And there, there are conversations. There's initiative on plastic. There is the coalition of trade ministers for green trade. There's a conversation. There's a working group. And, and trade was mentioned at the last COP meeting as well. So, so things are happening. But, but what more could be done realistically? We know that WTO is facing a lot of, of difficulties. It's hard to agree. But what could be done on a short and long-term basis, realistically? If you start, Ignacio, and then Jennifer. Okay. Well, I'm going to profit from the fact that I am no longer an official to say not so much what can be done, but to say a bit more what should be done. Because I think it's going to be a challenge. And, uh, having been to, in MC13, to, I share the disappointment of so many people it was not possible even to agree on a paragraph on trade and environment in the ministerial declaration in the, in the WTO, which mentioned the importance of the WTO to make a contribution towards climate. But the reality is that there's a lot of conversations going on in the WTO about trade and environment and about trade and climate. Only last year, at least 12 papers were presented by countries at all levels of development to propose discussions about the issue of trade-related climate measures. I mean, very recently, the United States has presented a very good paper also suggesting discussion on this matter. There's a lot of interest to try to see how the WTO could make a contribution to, towards these climate challenges, which are so closely linked to trade, that if you don't contribute to them in the WTO, where it is going to be possible to find the, to find the response. So my own personal view, and I say it's a personal view, is that one really needs to start to be thinking about where there would be an appetite to launch an open plurilateral initiative in the WTO about trade and climate. Now, it's not going to be simple. In my view, for this uh, initiative to have a uh, meaning, it would need to cover the four issues, which I mentioned uh, in the beginning, how you can cooperate towards decarbonizing the carbon intensive sectors, how you can contribute uh, towards expanding trade and investment on green uh, renewable energy, how you can actually look into how to incentivate good subsidies and disincentivate bad subsidies, and how can you support developing countries in this endeavor. Now, I think these are the issues that really matter from the trade and the climate interface. And one should, in my view, begin to explore what is the appetite to start an open plurilateral initiative not necessarily to negotiate binding rules, this is probably too ambitious, but not simply to be engaged in a tick boxing exercise. It has to be meaningful commitments towards cooperation and towards incentivating the good policies in these areas. Now, is this feasible? First of all, it would only be feasible if there's a willingness of the three big players to engage in that exercise. I mean, you don't have buy-in by the United States, the European Union, the, and China, forget about it, because I mean, we represent 50% of global emissions, 50% of trade. So if there's no buy-in by the three big players, this is not really going to go anywhere. And that's, of course, an issue on which we will not know the answer 
until at least the end of this year, where that kind of exercise is possible to engage. But it will also be important to engage some of the key uh, emerging economies. And they are thinking about India, and thinking about Brazil, and thinking about South Africa. A bit harder, because both India and, uh, and South Africa, as you know, they are in principle against unilateral initiatives in the WTO. For them to be engaged in this society, we need to make a very significant change of approach. I think that it is something that at least needs to be discussed with them, needs to be tested. Brazil would be very important because it will bring into the discussion the agriculture and the deforestation perspective, which again is going to be important if you want to look into the different angles of the issue. And of course, there's a very significant number of countries which participate in TESTI, which participate in the coalition of trade ministers for climate, that in principle, I think that they will be open to engage in this exercise. Now, is this politically feasible? At this point in time, who knows? I think that it's clearly not something that can be started uh, until the political situation has been clarified in all the key in all the key players. And in any case, I think it is something that needs to be well prepared. I think the more that you actually use the time between now and the end of the year to, to do much more to activities to gather information, to ensure it's a good knowledge basis on which to engage in an eventual negotiation, the more I think that this would be a possible perspective. But I have to say, I'm not saying that it's going to be simple, but I think it's what should be done. So I'll, I'll only second exactly what Ignacio yes. said. I mean, I, I totally agree with that. Um, and, and I think that is exactly, you know, what needs to happen and needs to happen right now. And I think to some degree, the U.S. was signaling that in this in this paper that they released last week, uh, which, among other things, calls for a member's retreat. Um, and I personally would say, OK, let's have the member's retreat and put Ignacio's notion of this plurilateral as, a, a, you know, agenda number one uh, for the retreat to come up with the mechanism to start that. The, the couple other things I would just add to the to the agenda, uh, I, I've already mentioned, you know, do what you can do just with the secretariat alone that doesn't require member agreement. You know, if there's more that can be done with notifications and transparency and the use of, you know, the committees to shine the light on sort of both best practices and worst practices, that's, that's you know, just one of the things that could be done. A couple of other ideas to just, again, throw out there that won't require um, the kind of agreement from all members, which means they won't move the needle as far as what Ignacio is doing, but just to throw them out. One is raise climate in every trade policy review mechanism, um, review of a country's policies. Every country goes through this, but there's no reason to not start raising a lot of questions about what each country is doing in certain areas of, of their climate-related you know, policies that touch on trade. What are they doing with respect to subsidies? Ask that. Are they engaging in fossil fuel subsidies? Do they have a plan for phasing them out? Where are they on a lot of these things? So that at least you have a baseline of where countries are and a bit of an ability to compare across countries where their climate, their trade related climate policies fit by just asking those questions and having every trade policy report reflect where a country is in terms of where it is on, on the climate perspective. And you may get good information about where they need help. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that you can use that trade policy review mechanism a as a positive. Second, you know, sort of idea to sort of, you know, put out there is could we restart the environmental goods agreement negotiations? Again, these fell apart. I mean, this, the idea there was to reduce or eliminate the tariffs on our, mm. all environmental goods. It fell apart because we couldn't agree on which was an environmental good and which wasn't. And we ended up in very difficult fights over it. And I'm not saying there, there wouldn't still be some of those disputes, but I think we're at such a tipping point in climate change that we've gotten to the point where we cannot make a perfect agreement the enemy of the good. Capture what you can and agree to make these reductions or eliminations of, of tariffs on everything that it takes to build, you know, uh, renewable energy, solar, wind, you know, et cetera, et cetera. All of the main decarbonization goods and, 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 and arguably some of the services related, could we just come up with even a narrow agreement to say, let's eliminate those? I mean, that's another thing that could be done you know, maybe more quickly, maybe, um, you know, again, it will require an agreement, so it will require negotiations. And the third one is to maybe learn from what was done in the fisheries, the fisheries one agreement. 
which was without actually amending the subsidies agreement, they nonetheless effectively added to the category of what is a prohibited subsidy by using that same language that members shall not grant or maintain subsidies on this. Could we even agree on a narrow list of things that you could get an agreement on that should be in that category of prohibited subsidies. So those are just three add-ons to, to the much bigger picture that Ignacio has put out there that might be things um, that countries, you know, that members of the WTO could, could consider doing. My underlying point though is the WTO, people should understand the amount of attention and effort and dialogue is just in a totally different league from where it was even 10 years ago, where you could barely utter the words environment and trade in the same sentence. And now you do have just dialogue and after dialogue and commitment after commitment where countries are saying, I get it, that there is a connection between climate change and trade. And we need to be having that conversation everywhere, including at the WTO. Yes, everybody's very impatient, uh, but but still, of course, lots of things are happening. I am personally very attached to the Environmental Goods Agreement. I had the privilege to be part of the negotiations before it was put in the closet. Do you think, Ignacio, that it could be taken out of the freezer again? In a different in a different form, mm -hmm. but as part of the discussion about how to facilitate both trade and investment, because I think investment is critical on renewable energies. I think that something on that space could be done, or I would suspect it would be focused on other things than tariffs. Or that tariffs would not be the fundamental component of what would be done. It could be part of it, but it would not necessarily be the fundamental component. We, both the European Union and the US, as well as many other countries, have elections uh, these years, and there are a few questions in the, in the chat uh, about this. Uh, right now, we have seen in Europe lots of demonstrations, farmers' uh, demonstrations, and there is a criticism towards the climate policy that is going too far, it's too costly, it's too bureaucratic. Uh, and we we have political forces and parties who, who are using uh, that. And we have a discussion, of course, obviously in the US as well for the upcoming elections. What do you think would be the outcome of the elections on the green and trade policy, speaking totally personal capacity, of course. All right, I'll start. Um, I'll just say, obviously, if if Donald Trump is elected, it's a complete disaster. I mean, I think what you will see is a huge effort to dismantle everything the Biden administration has done in favor of climate change. I think you're going to see a crackdown on government scientists. We're just going to stop, you know, engaging in actual science. I think you're going to see a frenzy of oil and gas drilling. I think you're going to see the Paris, you know, climate deal being, you know, the U.S. will pull out, and and what that really means for the Paris Agreement, we don't know. I mean, you just look at the things that Donald Trump has said. I mean, he's called renewable energy a scam business. Um, he has vowed to drill, baby, drill in terms of you know increasing oil and gas production. He has said that, you know, on his first day in office, he is going to repeal, you know, as he puts it, crooked, crooked Joe Biden's insane electric vehicle mandate. So I think a, a Trump administration simply means disaster um, for, for climate change and, and for U.S. efforts, you know, in this area. The one tiny silver lining is, from the Biden administration's approach of, of, again, using heavy subsidies and particularly the Inflation Reduction Act is, I think Trump is going to find those harder to get rid of um, than he might imagine. I mean, the vast majority of that I IRA money has gone into red states that are Trump supporters that are now, again, engaged in a lot of economic activity. We've got a lot of shovels in the ground, facilities being built, people being employed on the backs of some of that IRA money. So to me, the one thing that might stay in place um, if Trump is elected is is some of those um, IRA subsidies, but everything else I think will be an absolute disaster. And obviously if Biden is reelected, I think what you can expect is on the one hand, more of the same, heavy investment in trying to develop green technology, heavy commitment, a serious commitment to again, meeting the United States' Paris Agreement goals, heavy use of regulation and, and subsidies, but clearly an openness to working with allies, working with trading partners, trying to figure out whether there are some of these, you know, both, you know, transatlantic and more broadly alliances that could could brought, be brought to bear in, in, in the climate change fight. 
and some some decision on carbon fees? Again, I think there's many in the Congress that are pushing it. And, you know, again, so far, politically, I think the Biden administration is saying no, but I, I would not rule it out. I mean, I think a lot of uh, there's a lot of in general, a sense that something like the Clean Competition Act um, could be moved. Thank you. And Ignacio, we have elections in the European Parliament uh, the first week in June. We have elections in June. Uh, and I think it's difficult to imagine that there could be a 180 degree shift on policy. I mean, in the European Union, you always work uh, by coalitions. So I suspect that uh, no matter what is the outcome of the European Parliament elections, uh, still there's going to be a commitment uh, to the Green Deal. Uh, still there's going to be a commitment uh, to the target uh, of becoming uh, carbon neutral by 2050. I suspect there's going to be a greater uh, attention being paid to issues relating to competitiveness. There have been some criticism that some of the legislation that has been uh, adopted, and it's a lot of legislation that has been adopted, has been perhaps too burdensome on business. So I think there's going to be some concern about can you achieve your objectives in a manner which imposes less burdens uh, on business. I hope there's also going to be an acknowledgement that as we are legislating on issues which go way beyond the European Union uh, jurisdiction, you also need to have sufficient scope in your legislation to cooperate with others. And I think that's what I think is going to be very important as we move towards the phase of implementation of legislation like CIVAN or that the deforestation the legislation that would emphasize more the dimension of cooperating the, with others in implementing our Green Deal the measures. But I mean, all of this is a little bit something that for the time being the, is wishful thinking. We will need to see what it is that happens in the European the Union elections. But I would certainly not expect that there will be any move away from the idea of our commitment to the Green Deal, which is binding legislation in the European Union, perhaps a greater attention to issues relating to competitiveness. Well, lots uh, to be seen uh, with important elections and uh, lots of things happening right now. I'm sure we will come back to this. Ignacio Garcia Becero, Professor Jennifer Hillman, you've been very generous with your time and your knowledge. Thank you so much for participating at Tradewinds and thank you to all of you who have been watching. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be Thanks with you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank it was you. really a pleasure. Goodbye. Thank you, Jennifer, for your time. I hope oh. you will make it for your class. Oh, no, no, no. Thank you. I'm I'm good. I, I have at least, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. So I'm I'm good. Thank you. I hope Thank I hope you. that was helpful. That was super helpful. I'm sorry we couldn't pick up on all your points because